talking today to Alex Perry, who is the author of Lifeblood, How to Change the World One Dead Mosquito at the Time, at a time, and is also the Africa Bureau chief for Time magazine. Alex, what is malaria and what parts of the world does it affect? Uh, well, malaria is about the most ancient disease there is. Um, there's there's a, a debate among malariologists that malaria is actually life, uh, that it, it, it's one of our earliest organisms. And in fact, there's a, there's a part of the malaria parasite um, that indicates a previous ability to photosynthesize. So, so at one point, malaria was plant life. Um, it's been around for hundreds of millions of years. There are um, scores of, well, actually hundreds, if not thousands, of different strains, and there are new ones discovered every year. Um, it affects half the planet. Three billion people are at risk of catching it every year. Between 250 and 500 million people do. And at the start of the campaign that I talk about in the book, a million people a year were dying from it. Um, it is um, original disease. Yeah. Um, and the point of the book is, 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 is that it is, its damage is, uh, can be measured as much in terms of health, um, or can be as, measured as much in terms of economics as in health. It kills people, but it also... It makes it, them poorer. Yes. It imprisons particularly Africa. Yeah. Um, in, in poverty um, and it's at, at its most concentrated uh, around the equator um, that's when you get the heaviest malaria in the world and what's the history been of eradicating the disease well it's um, you go back a century malaria was everywhere in the world even in the Antarctic and the Arctic uh, the states didn't get rid of malaria until the 50s it was in parts of Europe and Essex and so on uh, till about the same sort of time now um, about a hundred countries of the 200 in the world have got rid of it, um, and there are a hundred still to go. As I say, the concentration is in Africa, um, and it is not hard to do. We know mm. how to do this. The technology is very basic. It's about spraying um, with insecticide sprays uh, around a house or, or place of work, and it's about bed nets. That is literally all you need, and that's how we got rid of it in the West. And why did everybody stop using DDT and has, what has replaced it? Well, DDT uh, was incredibly effective in the 50s. Um, it was the, uh, the big chemical used by the, the World Health Organization to, uh, and it was the uh, weapon used in, in, in the States and Europe to, to get rid of malaria. In 1962, Rachel Carson's um, wrote a book called Silent Spring, Silent Spring being in this very evocative title that, that there were no birds singing. The reason there were no birds singing was because all the insects had eaten DDT, the birds had eaten the insects and all died. At least that was the theory. And uh, this was particularly alarming to the States um, where it was said that the bald eagle, was the, the national bird, was said to be in danger. Um, so DDT was banned um, and became a kind of pariah chemical. In fact, it's now back. The WHO... Um, has put it back on its list of recommended insecticides uh, about six or seven years ago. It is no longer sprayed from aeroplanes in giant concentrations. It's about to the 50th of dilution that it used to be, and it tends to be sprayed, uh, administered by hand, people using little pumps and spraying, directing the spray around a house. Um, and it is back to being one of the most effective ways to control mosquitoes. The book focuses on a campaign to end malaria and a selection of African countries by an American philanthropist, Ray Chambers, who becomes the UN Special Envoy for Malaria. How did this former leverage buyout player become a philanthropist? Well, that to me is, is the, you know, the, the kind of personal key core to the whole book and the whole story of malaria. Ray Chambers was, as you say, he was a leverage... Uh, he, in fact, almost basically invented the leverage buyout, which for those that don't know, is, is, is about the most socially useless form of capitalism there is. It's, uh, you borrow other people's money, buy companies and gamble that they're going to increase in value and you pocket all the profit. It's entirely about self-enrichment. You don't create any jobs at all. Um, there is no creativity involved in it. And Chambers became very rich very quickly in the early 80s. Um, by 1985, he was worth about half a billion. And then made the rather awkward discovery that money didn't make him happy. 
um, and at the same time almost instinctively started hanging out at um, social projects in his hometown of New Jersey, which is a sort of deprived port town in, in, in the States, um, and had the time of his life. So over a few years made the transition from, um, from uh, master of the universe, you know, Wall Street vulture to, to philanthropist. What's really interesting about that transformation is that he didn't leave the lessons he learned in business behind. He took business methods with him into the philanthropy world. So he, um, he would use return on investment as a, as a measurement of his philanthropy projects. He would network for contacts for investors in his philanthropy works in the same way he would do for his commercial ventures. He also used leverage. Uh, and the way it works is a, is a kind of triangulation of, of accountability. You take politics, you take the media, and you take business. Chambers would use his money to ensure the election of the right kind of political leadership. Then he would go to business and say, you will invest it with me in regeneration projects in New Jersey, uh, and you know that these will work because I've got the right political leadership and I'm going in with you. Then he would get the media along with their flashbulbs to take pictures, uh, and write uh, uh, profiles of the new style of uh, rich, uh, benevolent philanthropist businessman in New Jersey, which was brilliant because not only did it appeal to people's vanity and got them interested, it made them accountable in public. Suddenly they were committing in public to regenerate in New Jersey. And with malaria, he used that precise uh, triangulation again, except um, with the biggest players there were. He used the White House, he used... Um, the world's biggest business, ExxonMobil, and he used the world's biggest TV show, American Idol. But what got him interested in malaria? Malaria, he cast around for a few years um, after 9-11. And if you're, if you're mixing those kind of circles, um, Chambers said he started thinking about what he might do for world peace, hmm. which is, <laughs> sounds a slightly to, idle to thought. Fill his afternoon. Yes. <laughs> but... Um, uh, I mean, Chambers' Rolodex is something else, and I mm. think if you're, well, okay, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you've got your own private plane, you fly at a slightly different altitude to the rest of us, and, and he is capable of, of entertaining those kind of thoughts because he's capable of doing something about it. Um, he found malaria particularly attractive because it was so easy to fix. The science was known. There was no sort of uncertainty there. Um, and it seemed like it was um, a logistical problem, as in a, a problem for, for, for businessmen to solve. This was a distribution problem. How do you get enough bed nets and sprays out across some of the most difficult terrain in the world um, in, in a kind of blanket operation? Well, probably you go with the same kind of people that can put a cold Coca-Cola there, or a packet of cigarettes, or get oil out. So. Um, it was, he saw it as a business problem, and he saw it as um, something that someone with a bit of you know, Wall Street hustle uh, and, uh, and business techniques um, could, could implement efficiently. The private sector was already beginning to realise that they had a self-interest in um, dealing with malaria because their own employees were getting sick. Mm. One of the figures who stands out in the book is, is Stephen Phillips of Exxon, who talks right. about this as a way of differentiating themselves from all the other bad oil companies. How do you think those people began to make a difference also as, a, as a th another force within the, the fight in malaria? Well, Stephen Phillips um, wouldn't describe himself as this, but he's, he's actually a subversive. I mean, he's been a company man all his life, but he pitched it to Exxon. He knew that Exxon wasn't interested in saving lives because they were nice people. I mean, they may have been lovely people, but they run a business, and that's not a core business concern. What he did was pitch malaria as a core business concern. If we fix malaria at our rigs and at our uh, uh, installations, most of which seem to be in malarial areas, we will be able to employ 20% less people. We won't have to pay our expats danger pay. We won't have to employ new expats because the old ones are dead. So. Once he, once he reformulated it in, in that way, that became a core concern. It was no longer something that they had to justify to their shareholders. The shareholders wanted more of it because it was making money. Hmm. It, also, it was also making friends, wasn't it? Right, and it allowed them to go to, to uh, you know, developing world governments in Africa and across Asia and say, this is what we're doing on malaria. Shell doesn't do this, BP doesn't do this, you want to be hmm. friends with us. 
um, this is going to make you look good. Um, you know, a classic kind of win-win. But the, the, the key to all of that is, is pitching malaria control as being in everyone's self-interest. That's what makes it sustainable. That, that means it goes beyond something you do at the weekend or once a year because mm. you've got a corporate social or beyond doing good. program. Yeah. No, this, is, this is about something you do for yourself. And Ray Chambers also got religious groups involved. How successful was that? It was mixed. Um, <clears throat> Rick Warren, who's a very famous uh, evangelist pastor in the States, runs a malaria program in Rwanda, which frankly was a disaster. Um, he... Why was that? Well, very deliberately decided he wanted nothing to do with professional aid. He, he sort of almost fetishized this idea of being an amateur um, because amateur derives from the Latin word ammo, love, and so on. It sort of fitted with a, a sort of evangelical love of, uh, of other people. Um, you know, as anyone can tell you, well, that's a recipe of a disaster. If you mm. don't know what you're doing, you're probably not going to accomplish much. And they didn't. Uh, what his his project in Rwanda became was essentially a, a, a travel agency for rich Christians from the States who would come in, often by private helicopter, hug a few poor people and leave. Hmm. Um, nothing really ever got done. I think it's t you know there is now the beginnings of a malaria control program up there, but it's been five or six years. The the the, the flip side was was or the good story with religion was in Nigeria. There. Although they had a very capable health minister, the local government level uh, was appalling, barely mm. functional, and if it was there, totally corrupt and just saw aid and, and malaria money as an opportunity to enrich themselves. So the malaria campaign decided to work around them, um, and they have a very strong church and a very strong um, Islamic uh, community. Uh, you add those two things together, the priests and the imams, you've got a million people. Mm. Um, they, the malaria campaign essentially did this kind of outreach campaign, very basic medical training, this is how you use a spray, this is, this is how you tuck a bed net in around a bed, um, these are the basic symptoms of malaria. Um, and use that network as their distribution network to get uh, sprays and bed nets out across the country, and it was incredibly effective. I mean, Nigeria is one of those countries that makes aid workers' hearts sink nothing mm. ever works, all the money always gets stolen, um, it, nothing seems to disturb the, the, the status of a, a, a corrupt rich elite and 150 million very, very poor people. Um, this was an astounding success, um, so much so that um, it acted as a, as a kind of encouragement to all the other countries that were running malaria programs. Nobody wants to be shown up by Nigeria. If Nigeria mm. can do this, mm. you know, Uganda's got to get its act together.